can you protect yourself at the internal Oops. level? Sorry. Is there an there. option to create a discretionary gap, a discretionary boundary within ourselves between what that person says and what we feel? Can we start to go no contact with the internal dialogue of what that person is saying? So part of the background is you have no contact, but sometimes you have to have contact or your boss is a narcissist or you have to co-parent. So if you have to have some contact, is there a way to have internal no contact? And what would that be? Something like this. And what I mean by this is by creating a space between what is said and being detached from what is being done at the internal level would be to look and to listen and to observe and say, this is what this person just said. And this is what I feel about it. If I increase the gap between the two, is it possible for them to say what they're saying and for it to affect me less? So when they say stuff, that's what we talked about earlier, that the narcissist keys in on your superego narrative, and then you have automatic translation process. But if you can create a gap in that ownership or following the directions of this inner critic or considering it or defending against it, then maybe that could be this sort of internal no contact. Let's see what else. Yes. What would it take? for me to be less affected by this person's words. Go inside your own mind and answer that question for yourself. So I can't switch off my ears. My ears are still gonna register the sound waves and my brain is still gonna decode the nonsense that's spewing out of their mouths. But I can choose to detach from it and say, listen, I'm not gonna take this individual all that seriously. And I'm not gonna take what they're saying all that seriously. Reactions, is that enough? Can you just do that? Seems pretty simple. Don't take it personally detach. I would agree. I've had quite success, I think, with being able to really apply this. It does take time. It is not, it is easier said than done, but I would agree that there is a um, benefit. Even if you just do that one step, I've, I've certainly felt uh, over two years of applying it, it's getting easier, the skills growing, and it is very um, helpful. Absolutely. Could you describe your journey of how you're developing the skills or pointers you use to make it work? Well, we talked a little bit earlier about the speed of the process that, that a narcissist uses to jump on you. Yeah, with the pace. I, I personally am a slower processor. I have a, a, a deeper thinking and almost a stewing kind of approach to and meditating on certain aspects. So that's a, that's a disadvantage for me, battling in a way against the narcissist adversary with their speed and the way that they uh, approach and would be able to tackle that. So combining the speed with my own internal attachment and giving them more credit than that other person has over me personally. I have to figure out which one do I have control over. I really can't do much about my delivery and the slowness by which I process. I really can't mm -hmm. speed myself up. So the way that I tackled it was, well, I'm gonna detach. I'll improve the ability to not give them that power over what they are saying about me. And I use the slowness to my advantage by providing that detachment space. So it used to be a, a negative, but now it's a positive because I purposefully slow myself, which means I can improve my detachment approach. So I use that ability to, to in a way, increase the space because I'm choosing not to react as quickly as I might have to some insult or some verbal attack, hitting the send button on an email within minutes. And now I purposefully say, I've got a rule that I'm gonna take 24 hours before I respond to any topic that comes in by email. Previously, we might be in an email exchange that could take uh, 15 minutes and, and escalate uh, out of control. So those are a couple of examples that I've started to um, try to use to my advantage and, and to increase the space that he's talking about. And I would agree that it is extremely- um, So the 24 hour rule or- It doesn't have yeah, to be 24 hours. It's definitely yeah. text. Create a gap before you respond to the text or the email. Absolutely. Easy, yeah. logical, maybe hard to do when you're reading and you want to attack them. Go punch somebody instead of reactively texting. And Deep, you're absolutely right. So there's three or four different mechanisms that um, that they use. And, and I took away phone calls. I took away texting, really. It's really strictly email um, communication. So I don't, I've minimized the number of modes that can be utilized to attack or provide that, to try to exacerbate my reaction. So that's limiting the entry points or slowing Correct. them down. Or first you have different ways of engagement and then now you're slowing them down because you're saying, 24 hours to respond or giving yourself a time gap. Very, yep, uh, those are, yep, those are two, those are yeah. two acts. Yep. Correct. Yeah. But the example Richard is giving is when they say something. So this is when you have to be in verbal communication. I mean, I would just like to address it there, you know, 
Okay. Which so is a lot harder. For, yeah. For anybody. Mm-hmm. What's the struggle? And yeah, I was just going to say on that because I think if you can force them to interact with you by email, that puts it into the cognitive part. Because when I'm with my wife and she's speaking to me and it's, you know, triggering my mom from 50 years ago, it's the make firing and I'm beyond my control. So yes, forcing it into a textual interaction. To a neutral territory or yeah. a slower medium of communication. But in person, it's a faster medium that gives them the advantage. Right. So has anybody had success at improving or dealing with in person or over the phone? Well, that's where, or, that's where drugs come into play for me. I'll see drugs. So drugs is another option. Well, I think the first thing you have to do is, I mean, it depends on what my emotional state is. And, and also it depends on the whole, you know, the hungry, angry, lonely, tired thing. Where, where am I at with that? So that has a big impact as to whether or not I'm prepared for an assault. So if you're hungry and angry, hangry and tired, then you're more susceptible. So you could try to make sure you're not hungry. So stuff yourself with Twinkies and other drugs. And how do you make yourself less angry? Process my grief. But okay, in the moment, it's really Meditation. about my identity. Am I solid in who I am? And for me, it's in who and whose I am. Like, you know, that I have a higher power and he's got my back. So you could pray or strengthen your spiritual practice. And that helps soften the susceptibility for being angry and tired. What else works for people? Deep, I've also used the, the non defensive statements to deflect and not allow for escalation and verbal exchanges. Uh, and it also will work in a textual context as well, but utilizing some of those types of statements or responses to not buy in or give them something to, to chew on. Non-defensive statements. What is that? Is that akin to non-violent communication? I mean, it, it would be things like saying in response, oh, I see. Very plain, very monotone, not going to incite any kind of riot. Or things like, well, that's your opinion, and you can kind of leave it at that. You don't give them anything to try to, to pull on if you leave it in a very neutral place after they've tried to excite you about some controversial topic. So there's other examples uh, of that. And then that neutral. provides you space as well. It helps create the space because you are choosing not to let them take on control over how, you're, how you react. That's not bad. Does it make any sense? Are people able to do this? Or do you need more precise pointer? Non-defensive statement, neutral, don't just share too much. Gray rock. Well, if you're too silent to gray rock, where you're doing no contact, or you're ignoring, or you trigger silent treatment, it's not as neutral. I would say that good neutrality is able to sort of suck the energy out of their attack. This makes sense, doesn't make sense, too easy. Yeah, that's the objective, suck it, suck the um, energy. Dumbfound them, the make them silent. I like agree and amplify because you take their attack and then you beat the shit out of you with their attack. Then you confuse them because that wound is already destroyed. You self-destroyed yourself with whatever their attack. But you can also do neutral. Same thing. A little more boring. That sort of similar territory is Biff. Brief, informative, friendly, and firm. But more so brief and informative. Friendly, I guess, do you have to be friendly in your non-defensive statement? You can just be neutral or non-threatening. So yes, non-defensive plus neutral. You don't want to escalate. You want at least a lateral move or a disarming move. So you're in person, they're triggering you. What's the struggles that people are having? I guess for me, the struggle is not responding. Like I'm good for a few minutes and I'm holding it in. Mm -hmm. And eventually I just feel so compelled to respond and answer, even when I know that it's not true and it's not right. And that's something that I really, really need to work really hard on. So what's your current strategy? Do you just try to will yourself not to respond or what? I do, and I try to, I don't even know if it's helpful, but I try to like look at another direction and just focus on an object that's in my clear path. So you focus on a physical object. So you try to ground yourself with the distraction. Yes, yes. Could you respond to a fake email or to a, another text? You could text a response to a dead number. That's a good one. Or you could send it to an email to put on hold following Mitch's example. So you could send it or text it to yourself and then give yourself 24 hours or 12 hours Yeah. to reflect on it. Then you still have the juice of what you did and then you can prune it down or respond instead of just your gut reaction. Definitely. It's just another tool. Well, it's not just a tool. So what it does emotionally is if you just try to distract yourself, you're triggered, you're wounded, you're pissed off. You want to beat some shit up. You want to get even. You're triggered. If you just focus on a distraction, whatever you do. 
that raw energy is in your system. Your amygdala is triggered. So it's shooting adrenaline hormones in your body that wants to fight back. So if you don't have an outlet of writing it out or getting some of your thoughts out, some of that energy out, it just implodes inside. You're stressed. Sort of like Holly says, you want to be, you don't want to be hungry. You don't want to be, be angry. You don't want to be tired. So you need some strategy that allows you to have an outlet, some level of catharsis to get that energy out. And then you can come back to it 12 hours, 24 hours, and you can prune it down to a response or you can delete it. But I like archiving everything or journaling because then you can track your response. Six months ago, you, you were spewing out poison. And then you can say, as you develop the meditation practice, you can follow three months ago. Oh, you refined or you're spewing out poison, but it's targeted darts. So six months ago is just like you're killing everything. Three months later, you can be more precise at seeing which jabs are attacking you. Or you can cut the time period. So instead of waiting 24 hours, a couple months later, now you can cut it down to 12 hours when you start responding. And then, then you can cut it down from 12 to six hours. And eventually you can do live speed. And you know, I was, I've actually been journaling, but I hadn't even thought about doing it in that capacity. Like journaling to respond to, you know, what the narcissist is saying. I've just been journaling for my own sake, but that's a, actually a great technique to get it out of my system. When you want to react, that's your hook. The narcissist knows your hook. Narcissist has your emotions on hook. If you want to disarm the trigger, you have to be more aware of what your hook is. So if you journal about those impulsive reactions, you can make sense of it. So next time the hook is disarmed, it doesn't bother you. Or if you're more advanced, somebody, the narcissist hooks you, usually their attack is also their hook. So you can reverse engineer the narcissist attack to find their wound because usually narcissists are strongest at their greatest vulnerability. So you can take their arrow, take their sword and chop into pieces, but that's advanced. That's sort of next Saturday. That's beyond Machiavellian. Now that's like black heart teaching because last Saturday was too wimpy. Oh, I just want to run away and feel safe. I mean, kind of anemic bullshit responses. I'm going to try to amplify it up next Saturday. I think my narc has verbal IQ much higher than mine. In person, she's a ninja verbal warrior. On, oh, you're not native English. No, oh, I am native English, but in her, I'm confused. In, in the so is it verbal IQ or emotional? Emotional response that clouds my thinking. Example, or can you be more precise? No, I mean, she, well, I think it's maybe her, she does word salad and, you know. Aha, word salad dissociates you. Yeah. Are you aware that you're dissociated? After the fact. <laughs> not, not, not during. Right. So you should review last Saturday and keep watching that until you're not dissociated. Okay. Because it triggered Kurt's dissociation probably. Because he was like, well, why don't I leave? So that's his trigger of <laughs> being dissociated. But if you catch yourself when you're dissociated, you can become more grounded. So you could just, this is a good pointer. What's the point of what you're doing right now? What's the point of what you're doing right now? What's the point of what you're doing right now? So if you're in a battle, they're going to try to take you to a third argument. If you can remind yourself gently, what's the point? What's the agenda? What's my bigger goal? And just something simple what's like this. What's the point of what you're doing right now? If they stay in the word salad and they do the dissociation, narcs or BPD, but if, if they stay in that word salad part, that can be really unsettling for me. But if they, like most narcissists, they're trying to get somewhere or prove a point or, or they have a goal, then I can usually diffuse that. It's it's really just the, the BPD that don't have a goal to get to that really gets to me that I'm still- No, I they have a goal. On. BPDs don't have a goal? No. You haven't figured it out? I had a back and forth with my mom earlier. I basically mapped out her strategy. So part of the strategy for normal verbal battles is who's more right, who's winning. And I said, mom, your strategy, this was done in Chinese, so I got to translate. Your strategy is we all suck. I suck, you suck. She's a killjoy. So she can effortlessly bring me into her emptiness. And then she just wants to be uh, the better empty person. The more expert at shame, the more expert at sucking, the more expert at the void. So I would say, generally, you'd have to refine it down for the BPD. Is the BPD is going to try to suck you into their emptiness so that they're not alone in their sad feeling or their intense feeling. That's their agenda. At least that's where you, that's a good start. Yeah, I can see that. So now you can sort of track their progress and you can give them fake joining. Though I like to just take the spotlight. So the BPD doesn't want to be alone in sadness. So I'll take the sadness and I'll spotlight me and i'll say oh yes i suck too so that's a bridge yeah i can't then I i'll take the spotlight on me and say oh my life's so horrible i don't, I don't have the job well. i want 
See, I don't do that very well. When it, I, I lost all my money. It, but, I, but once they start, I'm with so the, horrible. It's so terrible. My life is so sad. Yeah, but I suck worse it, than you. I'm sucking just like you. Up with, what kind of person are you that to think like that? How how horrible are you? And you know, at some yes. point, I, I just can't, they say that, I can't and then I say, follow them down into the hole. Yes, you can't keep going. You're not following them in the hill. Right, You're I'm stealing terrible. the spotlight. <laughs> You're taking the sunlight from their suckness. And saying you suck just as bad and indirectly what you're saying is you're saying is their suck doesn't matter because you're lost in your suck that's a non-verbal message yeah I don't know. What but it's it all an act like, you don't like, actually have to believe that you suck I what know. you're doing is taking their spotlight they want to be the center of depression I, I guess it's because i don't have any boundaries myself that i that i i can't hear myself degrading myself that much that it really you don't even need to degrade you. You can copy their degrading. Just own their story, except change you as a person. You don't need to be creative. These people are idiots. Because you're working with the emotion. You're not- the story doesn't matter. They don't write good stories. They're distorting reality. You take their story and then you just own it. And you amplify it and as long as the spotlight is on you, your center stage, they're gonna be pissed off. And they're just- they'll leave. Eric wanted an example of word salad, so... So in this situation, the, the person who's doing the, the dumping was just saying silly things and going in circles and not making sense and throwing out argument after half argument. And... I can give a word salad example in a minute. I gotta okay. find it. Word salad right is now like... we're trying to do the opposite of word salad to make sense of things. Jeff. Word salad's like a string of related words and phrases to the current topic, but they don't really say anything or answer anything or state anything clearly it's just a, a bunch of ideas thrown at you rapid fire meant to destabilize and confuse you Trump says. not necessarily yeah. meant to destabilize you that's their inner world I they're not spending funny. tons of energy to confuse you because they're confused i heard a funny a funny definition of a word salad actually it's like somebody takes a thesaurus and puts it into a wood chipper and then packs it into a t-shirt into a t-shirt cannon and shoots it at a microphone. There you go. Okay, so Trump's a good example of word salad. This is what I've queued up. But you can use systematic word salad hit with hypnosis. So it can be done uh, with intention. I'm guessing that Trump didn't really plan out all these words. So this is it in real time. You know what irks me? Look, having nuclear, my uncle was a great professor and scientist and engineer, Dr. John Trump at MIT. Good, good genes, very good genes, okay? Very smart. The Wharton School of Finance, very good, very smart. You know, if you're a conservative Republican, if I were a liberal, if like, okay, if I ran as a liberal Democrat, they would say I'm one of the smartest people anywhere in the world. It's true. But when you're a conservative Republican, they try, oh, do they do a number? That's why I always started, went to Wharton, was a good student, went there, went there, did this, built a, this is real. I have to give my like, credentials all the time, because we're at a little disadvantage. But you look at the nuclear deal, the thing that really bothers me, it would have been so easy, and it's not as, as important as these lives are, nuclear is so powerful. My uncle explained that to me many, many years ago, the power, and that was 35 years ago, he would explain the power of what's going to happen. And he was right. Who would have thought? But when you look at what's going on with the four prisoners, now it used to be three. Now it's four. But when it was three, and even now, I would have said, it's all in the messenger. Fellas, and it is fellas. Only 25 because, you know, more seconds. They haven't figured that the women are smarter right Hold now on. than the men. So, you know, it's going to take them about another 150 years. But the Persians are great negotiators. The Iranians are great negotiators. So, and they, they just killed. This they is a long run on. But I would have said at the beginning, fellas, you got to let our prisoners go. It's good for, look, you don't need them. You don't want them. It would send a great signal to the United States and it would make the rest of it easier. Nothing. How is that not word salad, Holly? Well, because I was following what he was saying. He just was starting a sentence and not finishing it and just continuing on with another thought and then another with thought. With another, another thought. Another thought. With the different discontinuous well, yeah, so, thoughts. Okay, so I guess it's a different kind of word salad than my husband gives me. My husband is literally in within one sentence. He's going in one thought and then the next thought all in one sentence. And there's a word in there that doesn't belong. That's my word salad that I get anyway. Well, Trump is a okay. public speaker. So he's had to refine his word salad. So it has to at least 
be somewhat comprehensible. If you look at his early apprentice, maybe he's well, not isn't as it... fluid. But this still makes no sense. It's more fluid yeah. that she isn't... starts a thought. But... Right. Isn't the word salad a result of their dissociative state? Because they can't even keep a thought in, my, in their own head. They can't keep their train of thought because they're dissociating second by second. Well, they have paradoxical thinking. That's sort of this issue. They have this part. The content which accompanies, accompanies certain events and people in his life, he constantly rewrites it. He has like 200 versions of the, of the same, <clears throat> same event. So they're constantly rewriting on the fly. So their mind is remembering stuff. And then since they constantly rewrite their memories, they do that live during talking. That's part of the word salad. But then the other part is that they have paradoxical thinking, which is the trickier part. Yeah. Is that narcissists, like other, like people with other mental health problems, they are capable capable of what we call paradoxical thinking. Paradoxical thinking is simply the ability to have, at the same time, contradictory thoughts. Now, by having contradictory thoughts at the same time, it makes them easy to do cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance essentially means the bad feeling you get when your map of reality doesn't match the reality that you're faced with. So when you have cognitive dissonance, because you have two conflicting thoughts, Narcissus has paradoxical thinking, which allows them not to have cognitive dissonance because they're always dissociated. Contradictory beliefs. You can't do that. You cannot think at the same time Wow, this guy is evil and this guy is wonderful. You cannot think at the same time, I believe the world is good and the world is, ho is horrible. You cannot have conflicting cognitions and conflicting values and beliefs. This creates in you something called dissonance. And you solve the dissonance by getting rid of one of the horns, one of the sides, one of the thoughts. Not so the narcissist. Yeah. Narcissists can, at the same time, at the same, same time. Moment, have conflicting thoughts, Love contradictory you, thoughts, and hate you. Contradictory emotions, hate you. Contradictory and values, suddenly love you. And contradictory beliefs. Why does he have paradoxical thinking? Because he doesn't exist. So they have a superpower of paradoxical thinking, which allows them to put words that don't fit together or they're opposite into the same sentence and create confusion in your head, or they create cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance essentially means. The bad feeling you get when your or you can do it precisely doesn't match the reality. That like, what is the question now? Like, what live. are we discussing? You can create cognitive, cognitive, cognitive dissonance, dissonance with these simple you words. Have to do that. Oh no, I was just curious. So oh, you no, say things out curious. of context, even though that's not word salad. What is the question? It's creating now? Like, cognitive dissonance because it's not in track with the rest of everybody's understanding. It's dissonant. It's also uh, fear of looking stupid or looking weak. I think if you're in a conversation and you're, or, or if you're in an argument and you say nothing, you might look bad or you might look dumb. So what they do in the heat of the moment is they keep talking, they keep connecting things together. And in their mind, it's maybe it's something coherent, maybe it's something genius, but they're getting words out there and that's the way that they fight the fight. To protect their false self. Yeah, mom does that. So she says stuff out, then she has to add more stuff to justify what she said because she's not tracking. It's exactly what it is. It's protecting the false self, right? So they're trying to keep the false self up with their paranoia and their hypervigilance and trying to keep the image up. But then it doesn't make any sense because it's a false self. The false self is one dimensional. So when they're describing stuff from the air and they're pulling different descriptions that are fragmented, it's non-continuous. Did that cover... Uh, word salad. Eric, you want an example? Was that enough? Yeah, that was a pretty good example, though. Most people aren't going to be able to do what Trump does, I don't think, but I can see them doing it on a smaller scale. Well, it doesn't have to be like Trump's speed, but it just has to be two opposites or two things that don't fit put into the same sentence or same thought. Mm. Okay, thanks. And then your brain wants to translate it. So when your brain has auto-translating, then it creates dissociation. The hacking of language is that you have an auto translator so you receive what people say and if they mess with the delivery tone and it's a little off your brain will get stuck trying to make sense of it yeah and if they attack you and say a charge about you or an observation about you you have an attention radar that wants to understand what the language is 
So part of it is that you need to create space. That's sort of what Mitch was saying. Yeah, that makes sense because I'm kind of a slow processor too. So I guess when your I'm advantage, just... you could use that. Yeah, create the time gaps. Yeah, I wish I wish I could slow it down because when my BPD goes off on her crazy ass tangents, I'm following every single thread that she's throwing out there, and I'm completely locked into the conflicts like well you just said this and now this and what about this and and then i'm completely wrapped around the axle of this bullshit you're following too close yeah you're too entranced you're in a trance the narcissist entrains you your brain and his brain become one brain she has you hooked because the borderline is going to have a very emotion effusive description of all these turns and whatnot but have you watched uh sports game or movie in the background or youtube in the background or listening to this music in the background are you all caught up in the music or are you following this the group interaction so can you take that same skill of divided attention of just slowly tracking what she's saying from a distance not fully engrossed in the guts of the details she's like yeah okay i got you you're here and you're at point b and you're at point c it's like a boring movie. Do you have any range of expansion at that point, or, or do you just fully dive in, Kurt? Uh, if I get to the point where I'm where I'm actually following everything she's saying, I'm beyond help at that point because I I can't back out. I, there's no graceful exit. What's your hook? Why do you care so much? I I don't know. I I'm so I think I carry into that situation my own fear of being wrong or being having having lied or been disingenuous or and i'm so preoccupied with someone set, pointing out that i'm wrong or or, or untruthful or that's one hook dishonest. being pointed out you're wrong that's a big hook what other hooks yeah. i just i just get you know so you're worried that you're wrong and and that you're inadequate sure sure i mean any any let me write that down this might be something. It sounds like a fear of negative emotions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It can be but summed up as that. Yeah. They're, they're precisely <laughs> you're worried about being at guilt or at fault over something. Can you flip it? Do the opposite. That was uh, Granin's video from a couple of days ago anti red pill. What's the antidote? So well, if you're worried not, that you're not wrong, giving a shit can if I'm you, wrong. Yeah. Not giving can a you shit fully own it? Yeah. Exactly. Being, it certainly diffuses it to know in myself. Mm -hmm. That so, so what? Maybe I did lie. Maybe I wasn't genuine. Maybe I wasn't on. So what? You know, I'm I'm still here to try and work it out. And, you know, what do you well, No, no, no. See, so what? Then go to neutral. Yeah. That, that's advance. So first you do so what? Own your hook that you're wrong or that you're, you're human. It's not that you're wrong. You're human. You can just hide yourself in humanity, especially with a borderline. So if you're dealing with a borderline, you can always say, I'm human. Yes, I'm human. I'm not God. I make mistakes. Yeah, they just, they I can't predict with, the future. Then they come up with some other crazy ass thing like, well, you always say that. You always, there's no way to pin you down. There's... Then you agree. Yes, you're right. I am made of jello. Actually, yeah. that's a narcissistic defense. Just say, <laughs> yes, you're right. So forget the non defensive neutral stuff. Just say, yes, you're right. It must be so hard being with me. Yes. Oh, that's good. See, now you're amplifying. So now you say, <laughs> yes, you're right. And you must be suffering so bad by yeah, being with be just, me. You're a saint. <laughs> yeah. See, it's easy. You're naturally coming up with answers. You don't need a giant script with 10 tips. All right, I should write a book. You agree. And then you just stay there. Because they're trying to get you to react. They're trying to get you to defend. Once you defend and you're running away or bracing up. Yeah, I mean, that's basically all it is. They just want an, want an argument. They just want to fight. They just want to... Yes. To, yeah, they're, they're desperate for that that resistance. Like, yeah. Yeah, they'll do anything to create the high conflict and then you buy into it. Yeah, yeah. So being wrong is one of your hooks. So next time you go, I planted the seed or we planted the seed. Just own that. I mean, and in, in, in general, from, from my work experience with narcissists, I've, I've picked up the tendency to disarm narcissists by by accepting blame up front saying i must have made a mistake i must have you know that i'm sure that was me i i'm sure i i had that you know 
and it, it creates a false sense of credibility. It's like you're, you're using the truth as a weapon. Uh, in the reverse, you're saying, saying, oh, I'm sure that was me. That was, and, and I can do that at work, but at home in a, in a genuine relationship, I can't, I can't do that. Doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. You can't stand well, by it. See what your hook is. Yeah. That's where you have to. Well, it's also unfairly putting that responsibility on, on you, Kurt, and that's not healthy for, for you. you. You shouldn't take the blame when it isn't yours to own. It probably presses my buttons. I probably actually do blame myself somewhere inside, and that and so I can't even. I can't that's hacking that yeah. Kurt's inner critic. So Kurt already has that belief yeah. that she's already hacked. So she yeah. just has to point it out. It so by it, it presses the button. You could do some more meditative practices where you're sort of trying to just observe your reaction. Observing your thoughts. You're not being your thoughts. Observe your reactions. You're not being your thoughts. Observing your thoughts. And then as you give it more space, then it not can... fighting with it. You let it come, you let it go. Not fighting with it. You let it come, not fighting with it. Because a narcissist and borderline, they give you the gift of being uh, the worst adversary you've ever... And what an adversary does is they point out your blind spots and your weaknesses. They expose your flaws so that you can precisely now work on them. That's how sports would work. Isn't that fair game in sports? You have film, one team figures out how to beat the Patriots or whatever, and all the other teams copy that same strategy and if we were until in a they counter. And if we were in a relationship, we'd stand up and say, that's not fair. <laughs> yes, that's a codependent response. You just cry lack of fairness, but codependents do unfair strategies too. So the second part of this, this. My lane, you stay in your lane, stay in your lane. I'll stay in my lane, you stay in your lane, stay in your lane. I'll stay in my lane, you stay in your lane, stay in your lane. I'll stay in my lane, you stay in your lane, stay in your lane. Any comments? Mitch sort of mentioned this. I've heard it about keeping or tending to your own side of the street. Parallel description of uh, the same concept. Same thing. Now, why would it be hard for codependents? Yeah, this comes so, straight out of 12 step. Well, because we want control over other people. We don't stay in our lane at all. Codependents don't stay in their lane. Yes, because I would say codependents don't know love. So codependence form of love is interference or enmeshment here. But if you are a diehard codependent, you've so, never known love. It's not possible. And you've never loved anyone. Mm -hmm. Not really. So we are fused with our partners. This is why I make the claim. Fusion. We never know love. We've never known love. Well, that is love no, it's fusing. We're merging with people. I'm lonely. Let me merge with you. Ugh. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> It's disgusting. It sounds disgusting now, but you know, years ago it sounded wonderful. So it goes both ways. The narcissist invades you, but you as a codependent also interfere with the narcissist. You're in their lane. Now, this is a tricky concept, how to have proper love. So what happens is that your form of love is enmeshment, fusion. So when you feel lack of fusion, it's destabilizing. So that's the cognitive dissonance of hoovering and devalue. So this is an example of the love side. So now I'll give you an example of the devalue side. It causes a bit of a crisis because if you don't really exist in the mind of the narcissist, then you find yourself sort of scrambling to be relevant. So the narcissist has emptiness in themselves and they're so self-centered, they're only worried about supply. So when they're not hoovering you, it's effortless for them to ignore you, to not see you. They don't even need to devalue. They're triggering this emptiness wound. Existent. You feel the, the threat of not existing. You feel the threat of not existing just by being their presence because of your grooming from childhood because you didn't get enough space. You're always conjuring forth your own self in the context of the effacement of your identity in the mind of the narcissist. That's enmeshment. So you've taken the context of the narcissist story, their framing, and then you're trying to argue them in their narrative to see you. That's how you get hooked because you're playing in their context, in their sandbox. But initially, don't they fuse in a way that resonates with me and my concept of love and then gradually it changes? They fuse with you, with your trauma. Your love is a feeling or enmeshment, fusing. The narcissist interferes with your dreams and resonates with your wounds. There is no greater intimacy. The narcissist interferes with your dreams and resonates with your wounds. 
There is no greater intimacy. The narcissist interferes with your dreams and resonates with your wounds. New person. There is no greater iPhone. intimacy. They resonate with your wounds, but the trauma bonding and the shared fantasy is a fantasy. That's not love. You both have the same aspiration for a delusion, except you need somebody else to strengthen your fantasy. They're better at gaslighting. You need somebody else to strengthen the fantasy, and they're in a shared trauma wound. That's the codependent love experience. Does that make sense? So this is kind of our half of this. Like the narcissist needs us to be a reflection of them. They need you to see them. They need you to reflect their story, their supply. Your supply because you reflect their, their false Image self. Image of themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we get the benefit of an identity as well. You know, we're, we we're codependent. Kind of on... Yes, but our, what's in it for us? There's something in it for us. What is it? The satisfaction. You're not alone. Jeff, satisfaction of what? So we're filling an emptiness? The Go satisfaction ahead. of serving somebody else's needs. Yeah. Yeah. A purpose, a, a role. Yeah, because our identity is in serving others. We want to be the best slave that master has ever had. But you're only seen as a role. You also have emptiness that can be triggered by this example, by the narcissist, because in order to be seen, you serve. You serve other people's emotions. You do other people's dirty work. You suck other people's pain. Let's see if he has anything else. In my history, if someone makes me feel invisible, Sometimes it's just I really don't have the strength to make them feel invisible. That would be trying to fight narcissism with narcissism. This is the trap. I think Celeste was talking about having that instant reaction to want to get even. Part of that energy is you felt invisible by the narcissist devalue. And you want to get the narcissist to feel invisible. But then it doesn't work because it's narcissism versus narcissism. They're faster than you. And they're more used to being empty. Because you can get codependent supply in the real world. So you try to... Your wound is invisible. So Kurt, maybe your wound of earlier you said being wrong. If you're fully wrong, then you get the feeling of your emptiness, your invisibility, because you're attached to being slave. You've been groomed to be a slave. That's your safety net. You want to be the best slave in the family that master to serve has ever the emotional you want needs. To be the best slave. That's the only way you can be, ever had. be seen. You want to be the best slave. So if you're wrong at being a slave, you're invisible. If you're invisible. You aren't going to be fed by the parent or you're in danger because you don't have a safe role to play. So the narcissist is hooking you by your emptiness that they also have. You both have emptiness. The experience we have when we confront narcissistic defenses in practice is often very de-skilling where the winds of narcissism blow and we are hapless, like a trauma almost of confronting intimately the narcissistic defense. Because a narcissistic defense confuses therapists. Because therapists are basically gaslighting. They're gaslighting you into social norms. So then they try to gaslight the narcissist, but the narcissist uses their emptiness to counter the therapist's gaslighting. That's why codependents can't be really helped by therapy much. Because you're already gaslighted by the narcissist who's better at gaslighting than the therapist. So then you go to a fragile narcissist self-help guru to gaslight you. Because the only way you know how to change and grow is through getting gaslighted. That was a complicated sentence. Was that word salad or did it make sense? Yeah, so describe what the gaslight sense. is. What's it the false? Sense. You need somebody is... else to tell you what reality is, to give you instructions, mm -hmm. to fill your emptiness. You're a, fo you're a follower. Yes, you're a lemming. Which gets back to if you can strengthen your self-identity and feel comfortable in yourself, then you disarm that ability to control you. If you find yourself, yeah, yeah. you localize yourself yeah. where you don't need an external. But one of the tricks, actually this is a tricky part of staying in your lane and getting out of other people's space, is you get triggered by your emptiness. But your emptiness is part of your beingness. Part of your sense of self is space, is room, but you've associated trauma bonding, enmeshment, emotional suffocation as your identity. You're interfering with other people. That's your form of love. So if you're not interfering with people, you feel your emptiness and you freak out. Your codependent identity destabilizes. We want to be the best slave that master has ever had. We want to be the best slave 
that master is ever had. You to be a slave. Be the best slave. To be the best slave that master has ever had. We want to be the that best destabilizes slave you. That master if you don't has ever had. have an outlet we want to be, to be a slave. Best slave. Help somebody create a secret contract for a cookie. So part of holding space and staying in your lane is not interfering. So Michael Brown describes it here. Those that don't interfere with me are those that truly love me. And Richard Grannon says it here. And I don't need that much actually to be happy. I need to be uninterfered with by others. I need my freedom. I need to hold my individual space. I'd like to be freedom. uninterfered with by my own interjects from my own trauma as well. I need to know who I am and to pursue the things that I love and to pursue some sort of a mission and a purpose. That's it really. I need to be uninterfered with. I need my freedom. I need to hold this is my love individual space. To be uninterfered with. So when you say stay, stay in your lane. lane, I'll stay in my lane. You stay in your lane. If I can help you and it's appropriate, I'll help you. This is more love, but codependents only know merging as love. This is threatening. I need to be uninterfered with. I need my freedom. I need to hold my individual space. Enmeshment is a norm. Having too much space feels like emptiness, feels like abandonment. So holding space is part of staying in your lane. Staying in your lane's hard because you want to interfere. You want to merge. That's your norm. That's all you know. It's always an emergency. You could just stay in this space. So this is playing dumb. Well, I, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I just stay in my lane. I'm good at that. I, think uh, else, I don't know. Well, I, I have no fucking idea. <laughs> so if it's not your business, it's not your expertise. There is no contract negotiation. You wait. You don't jump in. You don't enmesh. How's that fall? What if you never try to merge and you stay away as much as possible, but they keep coming after you? Well, so Richard talks about how What's the narcissist... The hypothetical? Why are they... If you're not merging and you're boring and they have better supply, why are they coming after you? You're not brain rock enough. You're not in your lane enough. You're still merged. But so what? So let's say they come after you. You're still accessible. You're an acquisition. Or, you know. Let's say they're there. chasing after you. Why isn't that a compliment? Someone's chasing after you. You're delicious. You're, you're yummy. Desirable. You're, what? Yeah, you're desirable. Well, the narcissist. Isn't that good? Yeah. Well, the narcissist uh, pursues uh, the three S's: sex, services, and supply. But I suppose that doesn't apply to mothers and fathers. So I don't know. Well, services mm -hmm. and supply. Supply yeah, is important. Supply. Yeah, you're giving them supply. You're a potential source of supply, so they chase after you. So they keep coming after you. So what? If they're chasing, they're losing. If you're chasing, you're losing. That's why they fish and get you hooked. When you're hooked, you're chasing. When you're chasing, you're losing. If they're chasing you, you have the advantage because they're chasing you. It's a good thing to be chased. They're wasting all their energy. You're just there and they're chasing. Move to your children's bathroom, bedroom, okay? What's the challenge? He is fighting leaving. Yeah, he just okay. won't go. He won't go. And okay. when I try to force him out, there's a threat of taking the kids. We don't talk. We don't go anywhere. We don't do anything. We don't have conversations. Just go away. Like, I'm done. Like, I don't, there's nothing I ever want to say. I don't want to look at you. I don't need anything from you. I don't even okay. look to him to help me pay the bills. Just go. He's a, a, a leech. Have you tried doing the opposite? What's that? Suffocating him. Oh God, like I'm just repulsed. No, emotionally myself. suffocating. Physically, you can do it too. That would work too. But since we're recorded, emotionally suffocating him. Well, is that an escalation okay. tactic? An escalation is not advisable for certain clusters. Well, it's an views? amplified tactic. It's not an escalation mm -hmm. tactic because okay. you're just doing the opposite direction. Yeah, Codependents so are have... great at enmeshment. So why not use it strategically? Yeah. Give him no space where he wants to leave. Because the goal is you want him to leave. You're trying to push him away, which is giving him a fight. Yeah, so, so she you needs do the to opposite him. by trying to keep him and hound him and just give him no space. And then he'll want to leave. You have to set up the, the storyline to make it work. You're trying to trigger his counter will, his inner rebel. You already triggered the inner rebel by trying to kick him out, which is keeping him staying. His opposer, you've already triggered his opposer. If you flip it, or now you're trying to suffocate him, keep him there. Now that inner rebel will want to leave. Yeah, the reverse psychology, right? 
because they're stupid. He wants a fight. He wants to win. So if you frame it where he leaves, he wins. Right. You win, but you act like you lost. You just keep enough of a surface that you want to keep him, and you suffocate him where he wants space, and then that's it. Yeah, you have to either suffocate them or starve them enough so that they go and find other supply, but they have to be willing to leave you for that other supply. Yes, if you can find second supply or better supply, that works also. Sure. Yeah, they'll point them into another direction. I think these tactics are really advanced, Thief. I, I mean, I don't... This is a foundation. So we had a meeting in March. I'll, set, I'll put a link in the chat, but this is the summary of the meeting in March. That's holding space and getting used to the feeling of invisible. Just don't put stuff out there. That's okay, all holding I'm, space is. Not putting stuff out there is holding space? Well, that's a start. Simply. You know, you're not putting stuff in the space. Oh, gosh. So you're letting space be, and then now you can more consciously create a container. That's even harder That's to explain. advanced. Holding the container means you have Creating to containers customize and holding. the container spontaneously in the moment for the situation, for the people, for the emotions, so you can get optimal space for the best meal, this, this the is best fun. yumminess. And that's Sherry like going, creative flow. I don't know how to hold space. I love so much interfering. She's being terrified by the idea of not putting stuff out there keeping her stuff out of other people's content because this is all she knows but putting a container so you hold space you put a container that's what i was saying to celeste essentially you flip the script you create a storyline where you're suffocating him that's a container and then he falls into the context of the container and he wants to run away but it's simply put as this just don't put stuff out there 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 just don't put stuff out there. Holding space starts with stop putting your energy and stuff into other people's stuff. Just stop that. Or wait, give yourself five minutes. Give yourself 24 hours before you put stuff out there. Just slow it down and magic happens because now you can start seeing what's real or not. As long as you're reactive and interfering with everything, the patterns continue. The trauma bonding continues. The entrancement continues. The masses entrains you, and his brain become one brain. The masses is interfaced with your dreams and resonates with your wounds. As long there as you're no greater intimacy. fast, the masses is interfaced with your dreams and resonates with your. So, just don't put stuff out there. Do just this. don't put stuff out there. Just don't put stuff out there. Just don't put stuff out there. So for people crying about this being too advanced, March twenty eighth, three hours, eighteen minutes. I bled in front of the group and no one could listen because codependents can't help but interfere and couldn't hold space for me. So it's archived so I don't have to bleed again to show how codependents have to interfere. So if you get over that pain of invisibility and your ability to hold space, natural space, human space, if you can hold space for yourself and others, you'll find yourself. There's room for yourself to discover who you are, who you're going to become, your beingness. I like how you put that hold space because it kind of means do nothing, and it means uh, sort of let God, you know, that letting go and let God. Similar pointer. Yeah. yeah. You've fallen for the grandiose trap. You want to be God. You want to control the outcome. You want to control the other person's feelings. It's a reverse grandiosity. You hold space, you let God. You let your emergent property come out. You let grace, you let your intuition help out. Things get easier. The right moves are more obvious. And then, you know, you can be lazy. Okay, and this is also practiced by therapists. It's tricky, it's a skill, so this is sort of give you hope. And another person that I've discovered who's pretty nice. Here. You have to learn, and it takes experience, I don't think you can learn it overnight, to have the depths of your own self activated and then to take a distance from it when you go home. So it's a skill I think we therapists can develop to be touched to be activated, not to act on it, to be internally aware of it, to Space. think what does this emotion have and to awareness. do with what's going on in my patient right now and use it and then try to tuck it away. Put it on a shelf, not own it. So one of the few therapists that are practicing this because most therapy 
the terrible. worst kind of therapy because in of my this. mind is the therapy that never challenges. We all as therapists have seen cases that have gone on for 10 and more years, Ten years. where the therapist only reflects the patient's unrealistic narrative. And it seems to be an ineffective, to put it mildly, use of therapy. I say it from my own experience, which mm -hmm. is going to garden variety therapists, experience. Yeah. where my life would be like collapsing all around me. Relationships would just be decimating. Yeah. Therapists tell me. They, I was right. <laughs> yeah. You know? You're Let never me put wrong. It this way. I think this angle might help understand it. As a therapist, perhaps the most central part of our job is to empathize with the patient's mind. Now, I think this is a subtle nuance. So this is a, was also covered in uh, Art of Empathy, Part 1, March 16. Empathy and sympathy are different. It's also covered in the vulnerability because the codependents were sympathetic, but they weren't empathetic to my story. They were trying to distract things to smooth out the terror of negative emotions, which is sympathy, but it's not empathy. But empathy allows you to work with core content. So now you can game plan the narcissist to help them, or you could game plan the narcissist to win against them. He's a therapist for narcissists and borderline, so he's using empathy to help heal them. Those therapies we're calling for supportive tend to offer sympathy rather than empathy, because sympathy doesn't go beyond what the patient is aware of. Empathy, the way we understand it in the group I work with, is to be in touch with both what the patient is aware of in him or herself, and also to be in touch with parts of them that they can't think about yet because it's too scary. The empty parts, the aggressive parts, the parts that are provoked in us through our counter-transference. And then this is good for a one-two approach. So I try to do this in this group. One of the first functions of therapy the first is part, containing emotions. Containing showing emotions that in this group. can be felt that the person might feel are intolerable so feel. or unacceptable. And you say, okay, these emotions can be felt and experienced and observed together. So, at so if you can't feel your emotion, I can trigger other people in the group. You can feel their emotion. So slowly you develop the capacity and the containment to feel emotions. So he's saying he, that's also the first part of therapy, containment. But then after the containment, what's the second part? As that happens, most often there's a degrees in acting out. Then we try to help somebody use what we call their observing ego, the process of reflection. Observing ego, that's staying in your lane, that's observing, that's developing the capacity to see what's happening. To hold space, you start seeing stuff because you're, you're merging with space, God's eye, the divine eye. That's the uh, technical benefit of holding space because people tend to experience in a sort of raw gut way and they don't engage as much the reflective process. So as therapy evolves, two things happen. First of all, people begin to accept affects, emotions in themselves that were totally emotional literacy to them before and that they discharge through acting out. Because don't forget, acting out doesn't mean misbehaving. Codependents act out by intellectualizing, fixing other people, seeking support groups, listening to YouTube experts, fragile narcissists, gaslight you. That's acting out. You're uncomfortable with your emotions. You take action. Now you can binge on demand on YouTube. In the past, you'd have to do more work. Acting out means putting into action an emotion or a feeling you can't bear. So you get rid of it. Now, some feelings do seem intolerable, but if you help somebody experience them, reflect on them, and then integrate them into their whole being, then you begin to see somebody replace acting out with reflection, the process of reflection. I think every human being should do, and frankly, not everybody does whether or not they have any psychiatric problem, but everybody should do. They should have an experience and then take a moment to think, okay, how accurate is my perception of this experience. So reflection is you take a moment and then part of that moment is reality testing. How accurate was my interpretation and memory of the experience based on accuracy, reality testing, not gaslighting distortion, where how can I change my memory so I feel better? 
How can I get my memories to be accurate and in sync to reality? Okay, takeaways. How did that make sense? What did you get from today? Likes, dislikes, annoyances. Graduation. Someone say they're healed. I have urgent need for success. Someone claim. I feel so healed, dude. Yes, Ben, thank you. So healed. For giving me the cookie. You can see me, I can walk. That's a cookie. Yes, I'm happy now. Anybody else with cookies? The time has come for this time to give deep cookie. Hey, sitting here if you're uncomfortable, Deef. I think that's success. Who's uncomfortable? You're uncomfortable? No, if you're uncomfortable not getting cookies. Oh, not getting cookies. Getting used to not getting cookies. That's success. No, it's it's success for me not to feel like I have to fix you. All for you. You cookies. I'm trying to put the spotlight on me. Why are you taking the spotlight tactic that Kurt says he can't do? How I did you do spotlighting so naturally that, that Kurt's saying he can't do? You see? I, 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 I have fewer cookies than anybody here. See? That's the tactic. You steal the argument, then you spotlight you. And then now I'm chasing. But then I can flip it and it's, it's like, oh, if I don't have this, I'm happy. It's not about cookies. Instead of getting all this inner critic triggered by people saying, I want to fix, I need this, I need this. So not having that is also a sign of success. Chayton's already researched transference focused therapy and it tries to fix the reality tester. So instead of just dealing with your symptoms, if you can figure out how to get better reality testing, so your sense of self is more integrated across multiple do domains, or a lot of the symptoms just disappear. They drop, they fade away versus 10 years of non-challenging supportive therapy where they say, oh, you're never wrong. Your story is always right. Your fantasy is great. You deserve it. Come pay me another $150 a session. And I'll tell you again, oh, your story and your fantasy is validated. And if I want a cookie, I'll give you a fix. Like, maybe you should tweak your cookie here and try this. So I can steal a cookie from you and charge you for therapy. So I posted 328. That's a classic video of the pain of invisibility and the nuances of holding space. And you get to see how codependents suck at holding space and they suck at being empathetic and it's right in the face. But that was like a six hour marathon back in the early days. So we had more time to unpack slowly. These meetings, I'm trying to do 90 minutes and it's hard to squeeze a lot in that. So just remember, or this is easy takeaway. What's the point of what you're doing right now? What's the point of what you're doing right now? So when you're triggered and you want to be reactive, remember. What's the point of what you're doing right now?